Dr. Hubert is a core investigator and economist at the Northwest Center for Outcomes Research in Older Adults within the VA Health System in Seattle. He also holds a faculty appointment in the Department of Health Services in the School of Public Health at the University of Washington. Dr. Hebert received a BA in Economics from Georgetown University and completed his PhD in Health Services at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Hebert's research examines chronic illness and, and disease management in older adults with a focus on minority populations and social determinants of health disparities. His research often includes innovative approaches to investigating and managing selection bias. Dr. Hebert is a frequently invited lecturer on topics and issues related to health service research, and today he is going to speak to us about instrumental variables, propensity scores, a comparison of assumptions, arguments, and empirical findings. Dr. Hebert. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for. Uh having it here. So I'm going to talk about propensity scores and uh, instrumental variables. Um, the reason for this is that we need to do a ton of comparative effectiveness research, um, and instrumental variables and propensity scores are going to play a big role in that. Um, the problem is that propensity scores and instrumental variables are like the Yankees and Red Sox of statistics. Um, it's really true that uh, some people just hate propensity scores and love instrumental variables and the other way around. Now, part of that might be due to the fact that they come from uh, different uh, disciplines. Uh, propensity scores come from uh, statisticians. Um, statistician, uh, uh, instrumental variables come from the work of econometricians. So it might be the case that uh, you know, if you were raised a, uh, a Red Sox fan, you were told to uh, distrust the Yankees and, and vice versa. It also might be a result of the different emphases that the disciplines have. So. Uh, Statisticians definitely have a history of working with experimental data, so sort of smaller scale, much more controlled environments, whereas uh, econometricians have a history of working with uh, large data sets in, in non-experimental settings. The famous quote of you know, no causation without manipulation uh, in the statistics world, whereas uh, econometricians are always trying to get at, at causation, and you can't really manipulate. You can't randomly assign a country to a gold standard, so you've got to come up with some creative ways, and those creative ways usually are informed by economic theory. So the econometricians have been estimating supply and demand curves for a long time. Uh, in order to identify the shape of the supply curve, you've got to shift the demand curve. In order to shift the demand curve, you've got to have uh, something that's exogenous to supply. Well, that's no problem. I just turn to my theory. I say that income is exogenous supply. Uh, I run a two-stage least squares uh, regression, I get the shape of the supply curve. Well, a two-stage least squares regression and that excluded variable income is an instrumental variable. It flows very nicely from supply and demand curves to uh, comparative effectiveness for e uh, econometricians. Maybe not so, uh, so smoothly for uh, biostatisticians. But nevertheless, it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, especially rational that you know, in some study sections that I've been on, if somebody's reporting on a study and they say, uh, you know, this person is going to use uh, propensity scores, and you know, everyone in the study section like braces themselves and oh boy, here we go again. People really do get exercised about this. So, what I wanted to do is um, sort of explore uh, why is this. Um, sort of briefly go over what the propensity scores and instrumental variables are, and then look for uh, differences in the theoretical foundations for propensity scores and IV. Uh, uh, and see if that is a major source of uh, this uh, confrontation. Um, and then uh, go over some uh, frequently heard arguments against uh, each that uh, I've heard, and maybe you've uh, heard some more that uh, uh, we can talk about, and um, how uh, each of the camps uh, respond to those, those arguments. And then um, finally uh, conclude with some uh, recommendations for, uh, for getting along. So this is the uh, framework that uh, uh, we're going to be working from. This is uh, you know, a typical outcomes framework. So we have some outcome, which I'll call Y. We have a, a treatment that I call D. We're interested in the causal effect of treatment on outcome. We've got some unobserved confounders. I'm sorry, some observed confounders, we'll just call X. So X is a, a lot of different variables that are correlated with both treatment and outcomes that are confounders. And then we have some unobserved confounders, which I'll call U that are also uh, correlated with both treatment and outcome, but are unobserved in your data set, and so are potentially creating bias. And then we have some instruments over here, and instruments are uh, things that are correlated with the treatment, but not the outcome, except potentially through the treatment. So a standard uh, comparative effectiveness setup. 
So um, first of all, just a, a brief review. What is a propensity score? Well, uh, a propensity score um, is something that attempts to create a balance in observed covariates uh, between treatment groups. It's typically done by estimating um, an equation, usually a logistic, but it could be a, a probit if you're an econometrician, of uh, treatment as a function of um, a bunch of the x's in your database. And um, from the coefficients from that model and those x's, uh, you create a single score called a, a propensity score. Um, and that propensity score captures how the uh, various uh, patient characteristics uh, get uh, people into different treatment groups. Once you have that propensity score, then you use it to uh, create groups of uh, treated and untreated patients, or treatment A versus treatment B patients, that look as similar um, as possible on the X's. And once you have that balance, then you uh, go and look at outcomes between these uh, well-matched groups. So uh, this is uh, basically how it's done. So this, these are the results of the logistic regression. And uh, the formula for getting the propensity score from logistic regression is just here. It's just these data times these x's. Here's the propensity score. If you wanted to do it in state, it's basically two lines of code. So this is not really very uh, complex to do. Once you got these codes, um, they tend to look like this. So um, here's a, a study of um, uh, ramipril versus captopril. Uh, these are two uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, so two uh, drugs for uh, antihypertension. Um, and some other stuff. Uh, here's the propensity score for the uh, ramipril uh, group in blue. Here's the propensity score for the uh, um, captopril group. I've done the uh, linear propensity score, so this isn't bounded by zero and one down here. Um, and the height of these graphs is just the density. So this is basically just a distribution of propensity scores. And you can see uh, people with, if you take ramipril, just tend to have characteristics of other ramipril uh, users. Um, so uh, now that you have those propensity scores, you, you have a bunch of options on how to uh, use them in your analysis. Uh, you could condition on the propensity score. You could stratify on the propensity score. You could match or do inverse probability treatment weights. Uh, conditioning is basically just throwing uh, the propensity score on the right-hand side of an equation uh, together with treatment and then have outcome on the left-hand side. Um, uh, there's been a ton of uh, simulations, especially by uh, um, Austin. Um, that uh, compare uh, these methods and uh, conditioning on the propensity score usually comes out pretty low, so um, that's not done very much anymore. Uh, stratification is a little bit better. That's basically where you divide the propensity score up into a bunch of groups, maybe 10 groups, and then just look at the outcomes uh, within those groups and you can average the difference in outcomes across those groups. Um, that does okay, but most of the simulations seem to favor either matching or inverse probability treatment weighting. So you take a person with a propensity score in the treatment group and find the closest propensity score in the other group, and then um, use that either as a weight or as a matching variable to create match sets. Um, so um, I'm going to focus just on matching because that's sort of easy and intuitive uh, for the rest of the talk. So here's the, the propensity scores that I estimated for this uh, study. Um, and as you can see, uh, it was a really sort of unbalanced after matching, and then after matching, it was this beautiful uh, uh, curve. So um, these lines actually overlap. Um, I was you know, quite proud of this propensity score. Um, so now that I have these uh, two perfectly overlapping propensity scores, I say, aha, these people all look the same. The only difference between the uh, blue people and the red people is that one uh, group got uh, a different drug, therefore any difference in outcomes between these two groups must be due to that drug. So uh, one of the favorite uh, texts from uh, folks who really like um, propensity scores is uh, is, is uh, Dehidia and uh, Waba. Um, uh, they reanalyzed data from uh, Lalonde. Um, Lalonde was a paper published in 1986. Uh, it was really uh, sort of a brilliant paper. Uh, Lalonde took data from a randomized trial of uh, uh, job retraining programs. Um, he took only the treatment group from the trial and then uh, took the control group from some observational data uh, that you could, you know, if the internet were around back then, you could uh, download from the internet. Um, so he knew that the folks in the uh, trial that were in the treatment group got the treatment. He knew that the folks in the uh, panel survey of income dynamics or the, pop the current population survey didn't. And he figured, well, if I combine those two data sets and run some fancy statistics on it, and those fancy statistics work, I ought to come up with the same result of the uh, of the uh, trial. So um, he did that, and it turned out terrible. 
So um, he could not reproduce uh, the results of the uh, trials, either by standard multivariate uh, uh, statistics um, or by using um, these fancy new uh, two-part Heckman treatment models. And this is back in uh, 1986. So um, uh, this is uh, right when uh, uh, Heckman was uh, on his way to winning the Nobel Prize for these, uh, these models. Um, they're not exactly instrumental variables, but they're you know, sort of similar to instrumental variables. So anyone knows the Heckman treatment model, um, uh, that's what these are. And they perform terribly. Um, so this was a huge setback for uh, causal uh, statistical modeling. Everyone said, look it, you know, we say we've got all these fancy statistics, but they don't work. Well, Dehidia uh, uh, uh came in, uh, you know, 13 years later and said, well, uh, why don't we try propensity scores? I mean, these other treatment, these other uh, uh, statistics didn't work. Let's try uh, propensity scores. And it worked. So he matched people from the trial to people from these um, other databases and used uh, multiple other databases. And um, you know, the significant uh, um, thing is that uh, people in the trial were mostly black, whereas people in, in the uh, databases were mostly white. So they weren't really very comparable people to begin with. Once you matched, you found actually a pretty good uh, uh, degree of um, uh, concordance between uh, the results from the trial and uh, the results from um, comparing a trial person to an observational person, um, at least among those folks who match. So this is a big victory for propensity scores, which is why this uh, paper gets uh, um, cited pretty often. So what about instrumental variables? So what are, what are they? So instrumental variables are um, uh, very different. So in instrumental variables aren't focused on uh, uh, matching patients on observables. What instrumental variables are really interested in is the unobservables. So um, they are like random assignment in a trial. Instrumental variables uh, tries to, uh, an instrumental variable is something that's correlated with the treatment that you've received, but not correlated with the outcome except potentially through the treatment. So just like a randomized trial, you get your random assignment and that's correlated with what treatment you get, uh, but not uh, the outcome except potentially through the treatment. Uh, so uh, people who like instrumental variables like to talk about healthy variation. Uh, these are, uh, uh, variables that uh, get you into one treatment or the other, but is not correlated uh, with your underlying health. So, for example, you might think that uh, if you're looking at a bunch of treated and untreated uh, patients, well, obviously, uh, sicker people are going to be more likely to, uh, to receive the treatment. So that's unhealthy variation in, in how someone receives treatment. But there could be other reasons. There could be like uh, just regional practices that uh, people tend to use uh, a, a certain treatment a lot in one area and not a lot in other areas. That's healthy variation. It has something to do with whether you get into the treatment, but doesn't have anything to do with the underlying health of the patient. So um, if you have one of these variables, then you can compare outcomes across uh, levels of the instrumental variables and um, use these to uh, generate unbiased estimates of the treatment effect. So uh, two really different uh, ways of, um, of coming up with treatment effects. The classic instrumental variable is the uh, draft lottery number. Um, I'd be interested to uh, hear if anyone has a story about uh, uh, when they saw their draft lottery number chosen. Uh, this started in 1970. Uh, it's a uh, representative from uh, upstate New York. They put a bunch of uh, dates in a ping pong, uh, in a bin. These are ping pong balls with little dates on them. And the guy reached into the bin and pulled out a date. The first date was uh, September 14th. And everyone who was born on September 14th, who was 18 to 26, was sent a draft notification uh, uh, note. So uh, they did this uh, 195 times. The first 195 uh, dates got uh, drafted. Perfect, right? A totally random thing that uh, is correlated with whether you went into the military or not. So if you wanted to know, for example, whether uh, we're adequately compensating our uh, veterans for their service, what better way than to compare uh, people who, whose ping pong ball got uh, picked at random versus the folks who uh, didn't get picked at random, or I should say picked in the first 195 at random. So this is a, a classic uh, uh, instrument of variable. Another uh, uh, new classic is uh, the relative distance. So when I was in graduate school, uh, this paper came out, and uh, it just uh, and all the graduate students were like, "Oh, I'm going to do instrumental variables." Um, so this is a McClellan Newhouse paper. Um, they were looking at whether uh, cardiac catheterization was good for you, and this is back in the uh, 
uh, in the back, I think their data was even from the uh, late 80s. So this was before PATH was everywhere. And they said, well, um, you know, if you kill over with a, uh, an AMI, you tend to go to the closest hospital. You don't always go to the uh, closest hospital, but uh, at least the distance to the hospital is one of the factors that uh, uh, determines uh, uh, where you go. And um, if that hospital has a cardiac cath, if the nearest hospital has a cardiac cath, you're more likely to get cath. If the nearest hospital doesn't have a cardiac cath, you're less likely to get cath. That's some healthy variation that we can use to uh, determine the effect of uh, cardiac cath uh, versus no cath on patients who've had uh, an AMI. Uh, so the favorite uh, text for people who love instrumental variables is probably uh, this uh, test by uh, this, this by uh, uh, Stuckel. Um, uh, they were looking at um, Medicare patients hospitalized for AMI to see if cardiac catheterization affected death. And uh, they did a bunch of different uh, um, analyses. You can see the un uh, unadjusted survival um, analysis suggested that um, cath was terrible for you. Um, you know, it was killing you. And of course, that's because sicker people got caths. Um, so um, they then uh, adjusted for uh, disease uh, severity. And uh, it improved a little bit, uh, but still, that's a pretty bad odds ratio. Um, they did, then did a couple of uh, propensity score adjustments, a, a simple one and then a fancy one. And in both cases, they came up with pretty much the same answer as the multivariate adjustment. And then they applied an instrumental variable, and they came up with a much different answer, and one that came much closer to the uh, results of randomized controlled trials. So score one for instrumental variables. Um, uh, uh, in this uh, match. So that's basically what instrumental variables and propensity scores are. Um, now let, let's talk a little bit about the theoretical uh, foundations for uh, both of these and see, uh, you know, just, just how different are they and, and, and whether that difference justifies the vehemence with which uh, people seem to cling to their uh, beliefs. So. Um, any time that you talk about causal statistical modeling, uh, everyone justifies their model, justifies their assumptions using uh, uh, this uh, Rubin's uh, potential outcomes framework. Um, it's a really sort of a brilliant uh, framework. Rubin also, uh, uh, with Rosenbaum, invented propensity scores. So, you know, if you just thought that propensity score folks were dumb and it's really very folks are smart, it's just uh, absolutely not not the case. Um, but the, this is. Uh, uh, this is uh, his framework, and um, he says uh, um, that uh, for every treatment you have two potential outcomes. Here, Y1 is the potential outcome um, for me, for example, if I get treatment 1, and here's the potential outcome for me if I get treatment 0. And uh, treatment uh, 1 is composed of the average um, uh, result, or the average outcome for people who are like me, or at least for people who um, you have uh, access for, so my age, gender, uh, uh, height and weight, et cetera, plus um, a, a part that's unique to me. So um, this is the average for people like me, plus the part that's unique to me. And the same is true if I get the um, opposite um, uh, treatment. So this is the average outcome for folks uh, who are like me who got the uh, opposite treatment. And here's the uh, idiosyncratic part that's uh, due just to me. Um, and uh, if you want to know if a treatment is uh, good for me, uh, you just subtract these two, right? So uh, this is the difference, this little triangle is the difference in outcomes, potential outcomes, if I got treatment uh, one versus treatment zero. And that's composed, again, of two parts. Um, the uh, the uh, difference in these two uh, quantities right here, which is the average treatment effect. So this is for an average person like me, uh, what would the difference in uh, outcomes be? Um, and this is something that you get from a, a, a randomized controlled trial. So uh, this is sort of like, uh, to the extent that we think that randomized controlled trials are the gold standard, um, this is sort of what we're uh, hoping to estimate. What's left over is um, the idiosyncratic part. Um, and uh, this is my idiosyncratic benefit from getting treatment one over treatment zero. So um, I got this, uh, this formulation from this uh, paper by uh, uh, Basu and Heckman, which is a pretty dense paper, and I was having a hard time following it. Um, luckily, I was having an argument with my uh, wife, Leah. So this is me, uh, this is Leah, and uh, we were arguing about uh, um, CrossFit versus boot camp. And it, it turns out that this actually uh, fits very well with um, uh, this uh, potential outcomes framework. So 
Uh, Lena goes to boot camp. I go to CrossFit. I'm sure CrossFit has polluted Texas as much as it has uh, um, Seattle. It's a bit of a cult. Um, and it very much looks like this. You know, this guy's hitting a sledgehammer uh, um, tighter and there's a lot of power lifting and stuff like that. And I've never been to uh, boot camp, but I assume it looks a lot like this. You know, but, uh, <laughs> pretty women with smiles on their faces doing lunges. Um, so Leah uh, won't go to CrossFit, and I won't go to boot camp. And um, this is why. If I just uh, put some numbers on, on uh, these equations, let's say the outcome is um, push-ups, just for argument. And say after a year of uh, uh, doing CrossFit, I could do, uh, uh, well, let's say after a year of doing uh, boot camp, um, I could do 18 push-ups. Um, and uh, let's say that uh, for the average person like uh, myself, uh, after a year of uh, boot camp, they could do 15. But I'm kind of good at push-ups, so I do a little bit more. So it's 15 plus 3 is 18. If I did uh, CrossFit, I could, uh, I could, you know, just for the sake of argument, say that, well, the average effect of CrossFit is no different than the average effect of uh, boot camp. You know, but for me, I really like CrossFit. I you know, like that environment, so uh, for me it's going to be a little bit better. So the reason that I do uh, a CrossFit and not boot camp is not because I believe that mu1 and mu0 are different, but because that I think that uh, CrossFit is better uh, for me than for the average person. Um, and Leah, actually Leah uh, doesn't do CrossFit because she doesn't want to look like this. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, but you, uh, I'm going to use this. Uh, refer back to this uh, example a couple of times. Um, so um, obviously you can't see both y1 and y0. You can't see uh, my result of having done uh, CrossFit um, and uh, boot camp because I can only do one or the other. I can't go back in time and do the other one. Um, so Rubin's uh, uh, solution to this is say, uh, well, uh, if you got uh, uh, the treatment, say uh, CrossFit is, is one, if you got the treatment, then you observe uh, Y1. If you uh, got the control of boot camp, then you, then you observe uh, Y0. Well, if you just plug these uh, previous expressions for Y1 and Y0 into this uh, larger expression, and then sort of like rearrange the, the terms here, you come up with um, this expression down here. So um, this is nice because suddenly this is something that you can estimate. Here's observed Ys, not these potential Ys, actually observed Ys over here. Here's a bunch of observed x's right here, and here's treatment. So if you just threw this into a, a big old regression, these would be your betas on uh, the x's, and these, this would be your uh, beta on uh, treatment. And uh, whether this term right here, this little triangle, is equal to the average treatment effect, the same thing that we would get from a trial, depends on the value of this uh, term over here. So uh, under what conditions was, is, uh, is, is that term um, zero, so that uh, when we run on uh, some sort of a, a regression, we get, um, we get uh, the average treatment effect back. Well, um, again, through a little bit of uh, a rearranging of terms, you come up with this uh, really nifty uh, expression. And it shows that um, this, uh, here's the uh, average treatment effect right here, and here's this big error term. So if this big error term is equal to zero, then the regression is going to return the average treatment effect. Well, um, that will occur if the red part is zero and the blue part is zero. The uh, red part is a difference in unobserved uh, potential outcomes um, among people who choose CrossFit over boot camp. So it's the, um, if U0 is the uh, underlying ability to do a, a, a push-up regardless of what treatment that you get, and if people who uh, take CrossFit are uh, just, in general, uh, better at doing uh, 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 push-ups than people who don't um, take CrossFit, well, they'll bias your results. And this blue part is the, uh, the idiosyncratic gain. So if people know, like me, know that they're going to do better in, in uh, CrossFit than boot camp, enroll in CrossFit, then uh, this uh, number will uh, be greater than zero, and uh, the answer that you get will diverge from the answer that you want. So. Uh, the uh, assumption um, in, in order to get these two terms uh, to be equal to zero is that these potential outcomes are uh, independent of treatment conditional on, uh, on x. So this little uh, symbol right here means independent or orthogonal. And that just basically means that after you've controlled for x, treatment isn't assigned based on, your, uh, on uh, the potential outcomes that you would get 
uh, from one uh, treatment or the other. It's just uh, assigned at random. This is uh, known as the uh, conditional independence assumption of the CIA to some folks. So uh, treatment is, uh, is unrelated to these potential outcomes uh, um, after conditioning on X. Well, uh, what about propensity scores? So a propensity score is just the expected value of D given X. So um, um, within this framework, um, the, uh, the way that you go from a propensity score to an average treatment effect is you have to make uh, two assumptions. Uh, the first is that all covariates are related to both the treatment and assignment. Um, uh, a treatment assignment and the potential outcomes are observed and in your data set. And the second one is um, that the selection uh, probabilities given X are strictly between zero and one. So uh, this first one is really important. This says that I have all of the confounders in my data set. There are no unobserved confounders. Um, uh, uh, there are no unobserved confounders in my uh, analytic uh, data set. Um, the second one just says that um, you can't have some people in your data set who are uh, not candidates for the other treatment. So, uh, who would not, under any circumstances, get the other treatment. So no woman in a data set of, that's, you're looking at prostate cancer uh, uh, treatments. Um, if these two things hold, um, then uh, you can conclude that treatment is unrelated to potential outcomes conditional on the propensity score. So um, uh, this is uh, the case, or uh, you know, when you make this statement, you say that uh, treatment assignment is strongly ignorable. That is, anything that's getting you into the treatment um, that is uh, not in your data set is ignorable because it has nothing to do with outcomes. So this is the ignorability assumption of uh, propensity scores. Well, what about instrumental variables? Well, instrumental variables makes um, uh, sort of two assumptions. Uh, I listed three here. The first one really isn't an assumption because you can test it. If you're going to test it, you don't have to assume it. Um, but the first uh, uh, one listed here is that the uh, instrument is correlated with treatment. So um, that just means that when you add the instrument to the logistic regression, um, it significantly explains some of the variation in, uh, in treatment assignment. It doesn't have to explain all of it, but it's got to explain some of it. So some of it could be explained by, uh, by uh, differences in uh, health characteristics, but at least some of it has to be explained uh, uh, by the instrument. Um, so, for example, if uh, Z is distance to a CrossFit gym, then uh, it would have to be the case that people who live um, you know, further away from the CrossFit gym are less likely to use it. The um, assumption that they make, and again, this is testable, so it's not really an assumption. The assumption that instrumental variables makes is that it's uncorrelated with uh, 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 U or Z. So, uh, uh, just like uh, propensity score says that um, the treatment is uncorrelated with uh, potential outcomes, Instrumental variables say the instrument is uncorrelated with uh, potential outcomes. So uh, that means that uh, people who live closer to CrossFit are no better at doing or worse at doing push-ups than people who live further away, for example. Um, so uh, that's the uncorrelated assumption. And then there's a third assumption that we'll uh, get to a little bit later that's not technically necessary, but if you want to get the average, it's not necessary to get a treatment effect that's uh, useful, but to get an average treatment effect you have to make a uh, rather heroic assumption that um, even if distance is unrelated to uh, your ability to do a push-up, um, uh, uh, the only way that the, um, the uh, IV will return the average treatment effect is if no one joins CrossFit because they think they'll do better than uh, a boot camp, or the effect on everybody of boot camp versus a CrossFit is identical. So it's basically impossible to to game the system. Um, there's uh, no heterogeneity in, in treatment. Now, if the treatment were getting your head chopped off, well, you get your head chopped off, everybody dies. It doesn't make any difference if a young person or an old person gets his head chopped off, everybody dies. But um, this is a much more uh, heroic assumption, um, um, as we'll see. So um, here are the uh, list of uh, the assumptions. And um, as you can see, at least to my eye, these just don't look that different, right? So here's the ordinary least squares assumption. Um, that looks kind of like this. In fact, in order to derive, uh, in order to get this, you actually have to start from um, this uh, premise. Um, so these two things don't look all that different. And then uh, this just doesn't look uh, very much different. So in uh, both camps, people are just saying, I'm assuming that something is uncorrelated with something else. Um, uh, you know, to my, um, 
to my eye, this just doesn't seem like um, a, a big reason uh, for uh, people to have such strident views about propensity scores and instrumental variables. Okay, so um, if it's not the uh, underlying assumptions, then uh, what are the uh, frequently heard arguments uh, against each other? So um, let's start with uh, propensity scores. So one of the things that um, I hear um, a lot about um, uh, propensity scores is uh, the ignorability assumption. That's this assumption right here. Um, uh, the ignorability assumption is really uh, not very different from the CIA assumption, the uh, conditional independence assumption. And as a result, um, you get the same results as regular old multivariate uh, regression. I, I hear that a lot um, coming out of my own mouth. Um, uh, you know, one of the things about propensity scores is that, uh, you know, um, if you're lazy like me, they're really hard. To do it right, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, really just days and days of re-estimating these propensity scores as we'll sort of get into. And um, so often, at the end, you come up with the same answer. Um, uh, and it's in part because, you know, you, you start out with the same assumptions and so you sort of end up with the uh, same answer. So, uh, is that true or is it just my, uh, my impression? Well, uh, Shaw, back in 2005, uh, reviewed uh, 78 studies, uh, published studies, that had both propensity scores and, uh, and traditional uh, um, multivariate methods uh, in them, and found that um, about 90% of the time, the, uh, the methods agreed. Um, so there is some, uh, some backing to this that uh, uh, you do um, tend to get the, the uh, same result. And I don't know if... Uh, Anyone wants to throw up their hands, but if uh, they have sort of had this, um, had the same experience, yeah. So, I mean, it happens a lot, right? So, um, what's the rejoinder? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, same is not worse, right? Always is not always. The fact that you come up with the same answer is not a bad thing, um, and in fact, there's lots of good reasons to arrive at the same answer through propensity scores than through our traditional multivariate statistics. And that's because you develop your propensity scores without knowledge of the outcome, right? You, uh, you know, uh, 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 it's really good uh, analytic hygiene to separate your outcome from your data set while you're developing the propensity score. You uh, develop the propensity scores to uh, achieve a balance in the covariates. It doesn't make any difference what the outcome is until you get to the very end when you have your propensity score. You then apply those propensity scores to your outcome and you're done. There's no, uh, there's no room for shenanigans. Um, that's not true with uh, multivariate uh, statistics where you can run the regression over and over again and see how the specification changes the, uh, uh, the coefficient or the p-value because you know we all like small p-values. So there's good reason to, um, to like the method um, uh, even if they uh, come up with the same answer. Um, and also, you know, the Shaw paper, uh, let's face it, you know, the best thing that happens when you do an analysis is you do it two ways and it comes up with the same answer, right? So when you do that, you send that to the publishers and the publishers say, great, and let's publish it. So there's probably some publication bias in Shaw's uh, numbers. And Shaw, you know, recognized that in his uh, paper. So that's also part of it. Um, also, propensity scores are um, preferred in certain circumstances. So um, this is especially true when you have a rare outcome and a common treatment. So if you, um, if you, uh, you know, have a, a rare outcome, so the rule of thumb is that you've got, you've got to have 10 uh, outcomes for every right-hand side variable. Well, if your outcome is very rare, that means that uh, you can't really have very many uh, right-hand side variables uh, in a typical logistic regression. But that's not true, as we'll see with propensity scores. A propensity score you model on the treatment, and if treatment is common, then you can have dozens and dozens of uh, right-hand side variables and not violate that events per variable uh, uh, Mantra. And secondly, um, uh, propensity scores are also good when the data sets are small, sort of for the same reason, but uh, some simulation results when you've got small data sets, sort of like statisticians uh, typically have, uh, they tend to perform better than traditional statistics. Um, and finally, uh, you know, maybe they agreed in Shaw, but they don't have to agree. Here's a uh, study that was done by Martins where he did a, uh, um, a simulation and showed, in fact, uh, um, this is. Um, the uh, ratio of uh, 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 actual to estimated uh, 
uh, treatment effects, and he showed that uh, actually propensity scores uh, got it right more often than uh, traditional multivariate uh, statistics. Um, should say that uh, these tended to be very large uh, odds ratios that he's talking about, much larger than I typically see, you know, in the two and the two and a half range, um, and a pretty small data set, so in the, you know, 400, 500, probably pretty much a lot smaller than everyone else is dealing with here. But, that, um, but it's not the case that you have to come up with the same answer. So um, what about the second reason? Well, how can you be sure you've got all the confounders in your data set? I mean, this is a really big assumption. I have all the confounders in my data set. If we were going to do a, a, uh, uh, a comparison of CrossFit versus Bootkin, you would have to have a ton of right-hand side variables to you know, measure all of the ways that this guy is different from that guy. I mean, you'd need his diet and sleeping and job and a, a lot of stuff that, uh, uh, that would uh, distinguish these two people just from the, uh, uh, you know, from the looks of this paper. Well, the propensity score folks say, yeah, exactly. That's why propensity scores are so great. So uh, uh, with propensity scores, you can estimate, you can and should, and are supposed to estimate highly anti-parsimonious uh, models with uh, many, many uh, uh, right-hand side variables. And you're not supposed to be checking the, the uh, uh, p-values on these variables. Um, you're uh, supposed to be adding all the variables that have something to do with the outcome because you want your model to have everything, all of the confounders in it. So, for example, Ruben um, was estimating the effect of smoking on healthcare costs. And he modeled smoking as a function of uh, age, occupation, gender, sort of the stuff that we would throw into the model. Um, but he also threw in uh, seatbelt use, number of friends, frequency of having friends over for dinner, memberships in clubs. Um, he, he suggested that the variables should not be included are effectively known to have no possible connection to the outcome, such as random numbers or the weather halfway around the world. And then, and then warned against five-way interactions between these variables. So that's how anti-parsimonious these models are supposed to be. Um, and there's no way that you could build a, a model like that with a traditional, um, uh, a traditional logistic regression. Uh, Peter Austin uh, modeled uh, statin use using 24 main variables and 233 transformations and in interactions of those variables. So these uh, models are, are really big, and it's because they're taking advantage of the fact that you can, uh, you know, it's impossible to, uh, to uh, 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 um, overestimate or overspecify a uh, propensity score model. Well, uh, what if you don't have seatbelt use and a number of friends uh, over for dinner? Uh, well, then what do you do? What if you're dealing with like Medicare data where you basically just have diagnosis codes and say you are going to uh, put in a, a, a Charlson index which has, what, 15 or 18 or something like that uh, variables? Um, well, then you're kind of in trouble. Here's a histogram of the um, uh, frequency distribution of the number of conditions in the Gagne comorbidity score, and I think it has, uh, well, I guess it has 20-something uh, conditions. As you can see, um, you know, 30 percent of the patients in this uh, Medicare sample have uh, two or fewer uh, comorbid conditions, so even though you've got these 23 variables, a lot of them are zero, so you're really entering a lot of zeros into your database. Um, well, uh, Schneeweiss and colleagues have come up with a, um, uh, an interesting uh, solution to this problem. I've just uh, actually started playing around with this, uh, so I'm not going to speak uh, very intelligently uh, on it, but it's kind of a cool process. It's called high-dimensional propensity score model. So this is what you do. You um, get a big, big old database, and you uh, download this program from uh, their website. It's a SAS program. And you tell the SAS program uh, where the treatment variable is, where the outcome variable is, um, and where some codes are. And they could be any codes that you want. Um, they can be diagnosis codes, they could be uh, drug codes, they could be procedure codes, any codes that you want, the program doesn't care. It goes and uh, finds the K most prevalent uh, codes, and then from those codes, uh, finds the one that, ones that could adjust for the most confounding. So we have this nice little formula where it goes through every single code and said, uh, says this is the uh, one that's going to uh, affect uh, confounding the most and then includes um, that into the model. And I think the default is to select 400 variables, or up to 400 variables. So you sort of say go, and you go away for lunch, and you come back, and you have your propensity score model. So, um, so like I said, I've just been playing around with this, and these are actually results from an earlier one. Um, you, uh, you, uh, you get a bunch of codes that the model threw into the uh, uh, program for you. 
And um, this is for an analysis of early versus late start dialysis. And um, some of them made a lot of sense, like malnutrition um, made a lot of sense that that code was thrown in. Some of them, um, thrush, I don't even know what thrush is. So, uh, uh, you know, some of this is like, it's kind of strange. Um, but we actually ran this uh, analysis uh, uh, again um, uh, on uh, better data and I actually came up with some reasonable codes. A lot of uh, mental health codes, a lot of alcohol uh, codes that we didn't think about throwing in. So um, I think this is uh, interesting. It's worth uh, looking into anyways. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's the confounder issue. What about uh, uh, matching on, uh, on this third one, uh, matching on observables? doesn't improve the distribution of unobservables and could make it worse. So um, here's an example of this. This is again from the early start versus late start dialysis uh, uh, thing that I'm doing. Um, this is a standardized difference between early and late start uh, patients. So um, here are a bunch of uh, conditions. So if the conditions are over here, it means that early start uh, uh, dialysis folks are older, have more diabetes, have more congestive heart failure. Um, and you can see this is a pretty imbalance. You'd sort of like want all these dots to be in this little uh, range right here, um, and they're pretty far uh, out. This is this is unadjusted. Um, I also included um, two variables that um, are not in typical uh, administrative data sets. This is the trajectory of kidney function before uh, dialysis, and uh, here's a graph of these trajectories. So some people crash and then uh, go on dialysis, and some folks their uh, kidney function is just declining very slowly over time. As you can see, uh, a steep decline in dialysis is, it, I'm sorry, in kidney function is highly correlated with starting dialysis early. So this would be a, a major unobserved confounder um, in a standard uh, uh, database. Um, after I, a propensity score matched um, a bunch of folks, um, all these variables came um, into this little range of, uh, that we'd like them to be in. But of course, it didn't it didn't do anything with these unobserved. So this is not surprising. You know, if you're matching unobserved stuff, you match unobserved stuff. You don't match on the unobserved stuff. The unobserved stuff remains uh, 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 um, poorly distributed across your treatment groups. Um, uh, John uh, Brooks uh, likes to refer to this as uh, squeezing the balloon. So if you uh, squeeze the balloon on uh, observed stuff, that means the balloon bulges out on the unobserved stuff. He likes to give the example of uh, a treatment that is um, good for old people and smokers. So um, when you match a, a young treated person to a young uh, untreated person, uh, well, why did that uh, young person get treated? Because they're a smoker. You just matched a smoker to a, a non-smoker. And um, in that cell, in that young person's cell, the distribution uh, between smokers and uh, um, non-smokers across uh, treatment groups is even worse than it is in the overall population. So um, uh, squeezing the balloon is, uh, is bad for you. So what's the rejoinder to this? Well, um, propensity scores shouldn't be used when you've got a known confounder, right? I mean, you started out by saying, I have all the confounders. You can't then go and say, oh yeah, yeah I don't care about the, uh, the confounders. No, no, no. You don't use propensity scores when you've got a known uh, confounder out there. Um, the uh, second thing that they'd say is, um, that's fine, you know, when you squeeze the balloon, it's absolutely true that other stuff gets pushed out on the other side of the balloon. But by assumption, that stuff is ignorable. I'm assuming that I have all the confounders in my model, so when I match, all the stuff that I'm pushing away are not confounders. They're things that are related to treatment, but they're not related to the outcome. Well, hang on just a second. Things that are related to treatment, not related to the outcome? That's an instrumental variable. So it's actually sort of interesting that in order for propensity scores to work, you've got to have an instrumental variable. You just can't have it in your propensity score model. It's got to be external to your propensity score model. So uh, even on this very practical level, instrumental variables and propensity scores are, are really operating on the same uh, assumptions. So um, now let's turn to frequently heard arguments against instrumental variables. So um, the first one is uh, you can never find a, a decent instrument. Um, this is, uh, you know, most of my uh, uh, career in uh, graduate school, uh, my colleagues and I were trying to come up with an instrument. And, um, uh, you know, we were all dealing with MCBS and, and Medicare data and stuff like that and just like searching for instruments and every day we'd come up with some, you know, new cockamamie uh, instrument. Um, so, you know, I sort of, uh, I feel for this, uh, this uh, argument. Um, but it's just not true. 
I mean, there's lots of places uh, where you can find instruments. You just have to be creative. So um, here's just some categories of uh, where you might uh, find instruments. Um, remember, you're trying to get something that's related to the treatment, but not related to the outcome, except through the treatment. Um, and um, you've got to tell a good story that it's not related to uh, the outcome, except uh, through the treatment. So distance to a facility, that was the McClellan and Newhouse uh, one. The story that they were telling uh, is that uh, you choose to live based on a lot of factors, but whether the nearest hospital uses a lot of hospitalists or not is not one of them. So that's a little bit of a random variation that could get you to a hospital that uh, uses a lot of hospitalists. Uh, physician preferences, this one is used, being used all the time. So the uh, instrument is, uh, don't look at whether I got a uh, drug A or drug B. Look at whether the previous person got a uh, drug A or drug B. If the doctor is sort of using the same drug all the time just because he's comfortable with it or that's what uh, um, you know, they told him to do in, uh, in his residency program, then um, whether I got a uh, drug A is going to be correlated with whether the previous guy got a drug A. But since the, me and the previous guy have never met, our underlying health uh, characteristics are completely unrelated. So um, uh, this, uh, this uh, physician preference is being used all the time. I think that's a pretty good story. Uh, the geographic variation is sort of a, a variation of that. You know, there are just uh, uh, geographic practice styles uh, related to the uncertainty. You don't really know what treatment to use, so you just see whatever other people in the area are, are using. Um, and you can use that natural variation um, as an instrument. This is Teresa Stuckel's instrument for the uh, 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 cardiac cath study. And then uh, state level variations in policies. So the story here is that policies is driven in part by politics. Who doesn't believe that story? Um, which um, has little to do with underlying patient health. So some policies are driven by underlying patient health, but some are just driven by politics. And that part that's driven by politics, that I'm sure Dr. Moore will uh, talk about later, is a healthy variation that can be used as an instrument. Um, so what about this second one? Weak, uh, dirty instruments are worse than no instruments at all. So this is, um, this is the one that uh, really, um, this is the one that propensity score folks really stick to. Um, they really stick to it because it's true. <laughs> um, so uh, here is a, an analysis. Uh, well, first of all, what is a, a weak, dirty instrument? So a weak instrument is one that's not very strongly correlated with the treatment. Um, so, you know, if you throw it on the right-hand side of a logistic regression, it just doesn't explain very much uh, a variation in the treatment. Um, and a dirty instrument is one that's correlated with the um, a potential outcome. So you assume that it was uncorrelated, um, but if it's correlated even a little bit and it's weak, it can be really bad. Um, the reason for this is, you know, one way to formulate the uh, instrumental variable is to have the difference in outcomes according to your instrument in the numerator and the difference in treatment according to the uh, instrument in your denominator. And if uh, the instrument isn't explaining a lot of uh, um, uh, difference in treatment, well, then your denominator is getting pretty close to zero. And any time you divide something by zero, it blows up. And so any small differences uh, in, um, in uh, the potential outcomes in the numerator uh, start going towards uh, in infinity. So anything, uh, any uh, dirty uh, uh, instrument, if it's weak, it's really bad. And here's a simulation study that shows this. So um, this is the size of the database on the x-axis. And this is the percentage of times that the OLS estimator outperformed um, the uh, uh, IV estimator. And um, the different colors are the degree to which the uh, instrument is dirty. So when the, the instrument is dirty, not dirty at all, uh, instrumental variables is great. Um, uh, but even when it's just a little dirty, so even like right here, I think it's point, uh, 0.12, I think, I'm not exactly sure. But, you know, here's 50%. So even when it's uh, not very dirty, um, it's, it's no better than doing um, uh, an OLS. In fact, Crown et al. says an um, OLS outperforms IV in all but the most ideal uh, situations. So um, a couple of things to point out, first of all, is that, again, these are pretty small sample sizes. So none of my sample sizes are 2,000. I don't know about you, but, um, you know, as the sample sizes get better, especially when you have a decent instrument, the um, preference of IV over OLS um, is more pronounced. Um, uh, Anurban Basu and Gary Chang uh, redid their analysis. Um, 
And so, well, you shouldn't uh, just look at bias, you should really look at mean squared error. And in terms of mean squared error, um, uh, they have a, a program that you can download um, that will um, actually uh, allow you, allows you to choose wisely between a, 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 a weak, um, dirty instrument and, um, uh, and an OLS. Um, and, the other, uh, and the other thing that everyone says, don't use weak instruments. You know, there's a test for weak instruments, and if, you're, uh, if your instrument doesn't pass it, don't use weak instruments, and especially don't use weak instruments on small data sets. So just like uh, propensity scores, don't use them if you know you've got an, an observed component. So finally, um, a, a final thing that you hear a lot is um, IVs don't give you the average treatment effect. They give you the local average treatment effect. So uh, this is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit complex, and um, I've been using this example uh, for a couple of years now, and since I came to uh, Texas, I figured I'd better uh, make sure it's uh, uh, accurate. Turns out it's almost, it's mostly not accurate, but I'm going to go with it anyways. So uh, Dick Cheney was, um, uh, got kicked out of graduate, or got kicked out of Yale, um, and was uh, back in Wyoming, and at that time he was working uh, for the telephone company as a lineman going around fixing the telephone lines. Um, that part is true. Um, uh, let's say that he had a buddy that was uh, driving a truck with him that was born on the same day as, as he was. Um, they go into a bar to watch um, this guy pull ping pong balls out of his jar and um, pulls out their birthday very early and um, his buddy at the bar says, well, it looks like I'm going to Vietnam. And Dick Cheney says, well, it looks like I'm going to um, back to college. So the ball was picked out totally at random, but who went to the military was not random. It was based on their, um, their idiosyncratic benefits from going to the military. The, um, Dick Cheney's friend said, well, you know, military might be uh, okay, you know, staying as a lineman, you know, it's not that big a difference. Um, I'm not going to uh, cut it in college. Whereas Dick Cheney says, you know, get my act together and, and go back to college. So um, Dick Cheney in this case is a uh, defier. He defied his, his uh, draft status by going to um, uh, uh, by not going into, the, uh, going into college. Um, his buddy is a complier, and instrumental variables are only uh, informed by the compliers. They're, they're not informed by the definers. Here's another example, also mostly fictitious. Um, here's me, uh, here's uh, Matt Maciejewski. Uh, Matt and I went to uh, graduate school together. Uh, we went uh, to graduate school with Joe Biden and Charlie Sheen. That's the false part of the story. Um, <laughs> We would uh, often have um, uh, seminars that got out around happy hour, and uh, because we were broken, full of uh, despair and angst, we would often go out and have a beer um, after those uh, seminars. So let's say that we want to know if beer was bad for you, if beer was bad for your grades. Um, well, that might be a good instrument, because um, you know, the scheduler comes up with whether you get out during happy hour or not. Um, uh, you know, Matt and I didn't get to choose when we got out of class, but if we got out during happy hour, we might be more likely to get a beer. So it's correlated with how much beer we drink, but not correlated with our underlying ability to uh, get good grades. Um, Charlie, so Charlie Sheen would not be uh, influenced by whether he got out during a happy hour, because he's a rich uh, drunk, right? So he's just going to drink until his belly, belly is full. It doesn't make any difference if it's happy hour or not. And Joe Biden is a teetotaler. So you know, I'm sure he'd come to happy hour with us, but he wouldn't drink. So the instrument was not going to move either of these two people. The only people it was going to move is uh, me and Matt. Well, if you're in that situation, late, the local average treatment effect, which is informed only by me and Matt, is exactly the answer that you want. You don't need to know what happens if Joe Biden gets drunk, because Joe Biden is not going to get drunk if you um, expand happy hour. The only people who are going to get drunk at happy hour are uh, who are going to be uh, um, influenced by uh, whether there's a happy hour or not are me and Matt. So our data are the only data that you need to answer this policy question. Um, so that's one uh, response to the, uh, the late versus eight. The other is that actually there are newer techniques, a really complex uh, technique called local instrumental variables and uh, PET, which just came out this year. Um, both of them sort of championed by Anurban and um, and Heckman, um, that actually will take IVs and turn them into average treatment effects. They're very data-driven. Um, I'm using them, and in order to use them, you basically have to get Anurban on your grant at this point. But I think in the future, um, uh, hopefully they'll be used more often, so this won't be as big a uh, drawback. Okay, so um, 
So the summaries uh, of uh, the arguments um, against using propensity scores is the uh, CIA argument is the same as the uh, uh, traditional methods. Um, uh, uh, how do you know that you have all the confounders and squeezing the balloon makes things worse? And then on the instrumental variable size, IVs are hard to find. Dirty IVs are worse than no IVs at all. And this late versus eight uh, problem. Uh, arguments for each side. Uh, Prince scores are better with small data sets. Um, they're better for common treatments with uncommon outcomes. They're uh, great if you've got a large uh, measure of uh, uh, potential confounders that you can throw at the propensity score. And um, they're uh, appropriate if you've got no unknown, if you've got no known unobserved confounders. And sort of the opposite is true of instrumental variables. So if you've got strong instruments, a large data set, and a great story about why uh, your instruments are uncorrelated with potential outcomes, um, uh, that's when to use instrumental variables. So in terms of, um, in terms of uh, getting along, um, I would say a few things. First of all, be flexible. Don't be dogmatic. Um, it just don't, doesn't seem to make any sense to be dogmatic in this case. It seems to be a role for propensity scores and IVs in different types of analysis. So first of all, don't use a propensity score if you know there's a confounder out there. That's just dumb. Don't use weak instruments. You know that that's got bad properties. So no matter how much you like those two things, just don't use them if it's not appropriate. And conversely, if you see a study that has strong instruments, a good study, a large database, I'm sorry, a good story, a large database, then don't criticize them for using instrumental variables because there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that, um, uh, that they're uh, uh, unuseful in those circumstances. Uh, secondly, definitely show your work. Um, Anne you know, talked about the consort statements about you know, how you should present your, your work. Those are great. I've got a couple of articles uh, down here from uh, Austin and Brookhart that also uh, uh, show some of these things. So for example, uh, Brookhart um, says, you know, make sure that you uh, not only show how strong the instrument is, but to show how strong it is in different subgroups of your population. So you can show you're not just moving certain people, you're moving everyone with this instrument. And then also show that your instrument is uncorrelated with uh, the observed stuff. It doesn't have to be uncorrelated, but sure, if it is uncorrelated, that's great. It's, uh, it, it strengthens your story that uh, your instrument is uncorrelated with the unobserved stuff. Um, and then uh, this is uh, something that I'm uh, trying to do uh, more and more uh, frequently in my work, is to get data that's uh, outside of external to your data set to validate your assumption. So uh, Schneeweiss has a nice uh, paper on uh, uh, getting external data. So for example, I'm doing a study on, on neonatal uh, racial disparities and neonatal uh, outcomes. And um, uh, mother's uh, weight is a huge unobserved confounder of a poorly measured uh, a variable in this big uh, HCUP database. So we got some data on uh, actually how bad uh, the disparity is, and then said, okay, um, how, is it possible that that amount of uh, difference in uh, a BMI could account for the uh, differences in mortality that we're seeing? And those are methods that are, are described here. Um, you can also, uh, for a subset of the database, do some more in-depth stuff. So that's what we did with uh, our uh, dialysis timing thing. We've gone and abstracted uh, some charts to get some additional information um, to see whether, um, in fact, these are uh, correlated, this, uh, these are unobserved uh, confounders. And you can look at the uh, propensity score calibration literature uh, for that. Um, with instrumental variables, um, sort of the same thing. Just uh, get these uh, labs and other stuff and see if they're uncorrelated with the instrument. I think this is a great idea. Find a bunch of patients, um, see if the instrument is correlated with um, the outcomes of patients who could not have possibly received the treatment. So if you're uh, saying that um, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, the distance from a hospital um, to a, a robot for prostate surgery is going to be my instrument, and I think that's totally unrelated to um, the underlying health of the population, well then look at the, uh, the uh, underlying health of women. Right? If women are more likely to uh, 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 die or be hospitalized uh, if they live closer to a, uh, um, a hospital with a, a, a robot for a prostate surgery, that's kind of weird, right? That's not, that, that doesn't support your instrument. Um, and then uh, look into um, instruments that are correlated with outcomes but not correlated with patient frailty. So for that uh, ACE inhibitor paper that I did, I said, uh, you know, your antihypertension uh, drug doesn't have anything to do with uh, pneumonia. Um, so if I saw a difference in pneumonia between these two drug, uh, drugs, that would be really curious. Um, um, and since I didn't, that sort of uh, strengthened my assertion that uh, there's nothing different about those two drugs. Except, uh, 
uh, and then finally, um, test the uh, testable assumptions. So there's um, a bunch of tests out there um, uh, that you can do. So we do a split sample test for this H high dimensional propensity score model, see if you come up with the same uh, variables. Um, there are tests for the, um, uh, whether you're getting late or, or eight that you can uh, look up here, they're very easy to do. And again, there's Basu and Chan um, part of that gives you some tests on whether your instrument is, is dirty and weak. So, um, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, it's sort of in summary, the conceptual differences between IV and propensity score just don't look very big uh, to me. Um, and uh, being flexible and um, you know, support the analytical model that suits, uh, uh, best suits your conceptual model um, seems like a good, uh, good uh, general policy. So thanks.